Okay. Thanks I'm not for sure joining. My audio is working. Can someone say something? Can you hear me, Matthias? <laughs> I don't think you can hear me. All right. Um, you, uh, Craig, you have to close this pop-up with the search button because I accidentally tried to close it from your screen sharing. <laughs> there is this X button that I tried to close this pop-up on your screen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> Thank you. My life got significantly better now. <laughs> Uh, all right. Can you hear us now, Matthias? I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 It's it's this recurring thing where I almost have to unplug my headphones a number of times for Linux to understand that I changed my audio device. Perfect. All right. Cool. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining and uh, putting information on the retro here. So I ran through it real quick, and there are about 10 topics on here. I can't remember the exact number. Only two of them got voted on. So we'll just go top down rather than bouncing around. So first topic is grooming sessions. I was one that brought it up. Um, basically, it was just suggestions, set up grooming sessions or use office hours, spend some more time on grooming individual issues. Uh, any thoughts, comments on whether we should do this and how we should do this? I I, I, yeah, I like this idea because I also see there is a related issue. Um, Matthias has raised yeah. some. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I just, it just only now occurred to me that Craig had already <laughs> basically said the same thing a month ago. Um, yeah, so, so these grooming sessions, I, I find them really useful because you get different angles on the same topic from people with different backgrounds. Uh, and yeah, like you said already, uh, sometimes uh, the issues are very like um, terse. <laughs> uh, so it's sometimes, yeah, uh, difficult to understand what the scope of it is. Um, and it mm -hmm. often makes it even, maybe that's just like a psychological thing, but often it makes it appear simpler than it is. And then they often balloon into much, much bigger things. So I think it mm -hmm. would be good to spend a bit more time up front on this thing. So, but like, I have the question is like, is the grooming session about like, uh, item that is scheduled or the grooming session is about the item that we're gonna to schedule because like one thing that we would like to have like for the items that we're gonna to schedule uh, is to have them as well defined as possible to actually understand the scope of the work and the size of the item which sometimes is very unrealistic uh, but i wonder about that yeah, or is it like both I mean, I would say like um, it needs to be clear because if you schedule something, you kind of need to have a vague idea at least of how long it's going to take and how much effort it is. Mm -hmm. So I think grooming should help in res making it like actionable, the story, so that anyone could actually pick it up, you know, this like, ready for development. Um, and, uh, and it should be roughly clear like what the effort is. Uh, and it can be things as well, like maybe we start with something really broad or like course uh, because it's always good to capture these thoughts as they come up but then maybe we decide you know maybe these should be three stories instead because it's just too big so that to me is what gr grooming is about yeah yeah ideally we would groom these in advance of actually scheduling but sometimes it's going to happen where you're grooming while you're actually in the milestone <laughs> Should we also discuss any issues that are crawling into our milestone meet cycle? Should this also be considered as part of grooming? For example, some bugs appear. Should we also discuss it on the team level? So like, like at, at least like my, my perspective about like how GitHub operates, like you do sync call when it's needed, no, but mm -hmm. not by default. And yeah. 
technically, if it's unclear for you that like there is ambiguity there, uh, ideally it should be like the comment in the issue question to the specific person. If it's unclear further, this is when like we jump on the call and try to like resolve it as quickly as possible. But like the call should be uh, like the last resort. You start with the comment asynchronously, then like you kind of go on the Slack. And as the last resort, you, you kind of do a call because call is actually like uh, the most interactive for everyone's work that you like. For example, we, we have the import export call scheduled like two days from now uh, because we have to align everyone to jump on the call. So um, I would say if something is clear, like it's maybe it's good enough to write a comment as detailed description of the of like how you perceive that and like saying I'm doing that like that. If someone disagrees, please say me that you disagree. Uh, so kind of not looking for the approval, but rather looking for vetting that someone does disagree, disagree like with your approach uh, of solving that. So this is this, so this is kind of like my. Uh, yeah. perception of async work. Yeah, it seems like everybody agrees we want to spend a little more time on grooming issues. Um, I think it's now in Camille kind of switch the direction into how, right? So um, how would we implement grooming? So the way I've done it in the past with more synchronous companies is, you know, however often we have it scheduled, some companies we did it weekly to just make sure that we had enough information flowing about the work that was upcoming is we would have an agenda and say, hey, we're gonna talk about these issues. So please review them in advance, have some ideas, you can comment on the issues so that when we came to the meeting, we weren't all reading it for the first time. Um, so I'm not sure how the best way to implement that asynchronously. So we have the first conversation and say, hey, we're gonna try and get further clarification on these issues. Um, anybody have any thoughts? So, I, I really like Nicola approach of doing POC. I'm still gonna figure out what this POC gonna bring to the table of the import export versioning. But this is probably like one of the ways to uh, make it efficient that someone has much more uh, like engineering knowledge about the space so it can answer some of the questions. So uh, maybe like someone could spend ahead of the time, quite amount of the time on trying to understand that and us having on the call, like a sync call if it's needed, when we have this someone that is like very knowledgeable in that space so can answer uh, our questions and like vet our proposals on like how this could be done. So maybe like starting with this, like the better of POC, it's like the one of the good ways to, to do it. Not the only way, but maybe this is one of the ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, would we say that office hours is not the time and place to talk about any of these things? Because I do have mixed feelings about it. I mean, because it's also supposed to encourage like, you know, not strictly work specific uh, topics and um, it's difficult to tune out if you're on the call with a lot of people who might not want to be involved. But I, I, yeah, I understand that, you know, setting up more calls might be more disruptive in our setup. I think you can still use office hours for it. Yeah, I, I guess that it depends on the task and, and the issue. We don't want like to do this for every and each issue we have, but I guess that like if I have questions and you're available in office hours, we can like discuss maybe and clear things up if it's not enough like using comments in the issue like some debug session or something probably we can we can do that during the office hours at least we did with you and alexei for different issues yep so uh, this works well for me like if i have questions yeah no i enjoyed it as well it's, mm -hmm. it's also nice to um yeah for knowledge sharing mm -hmm. yeah it's actually not not uh, so the way so on the last what, synchronous team, uh, I was on, it was actually similar in the sense that we did have like this like standing meeting, I think it was every Monday or so, but it was like open agenda and it was optional. Like there was, it was an optional invite. So you didn't have to attend it, but anyone could put points on the agenda to talk about it. So the only thing we asked 
team members was to have a look at the have a look at the agenda. Is this something uh, you have an opinion on that you can have out with? And then those people uh, would use that um, time slot to talk about it. So it's actually not un not not unlike the office hours uh, we have, and that worked reasonably well because then don't pe people don't feel forced to attend a topic where maybe they don't have as much insight into or opinion on, and it's not as it doesn't feel as disruptive. Trying to look to see if there's a label we could use. Is there a grooming label? I wonder. Uh, there is, uh, uh, we have some of these labels related to like to workflow. And I think that there is some in this workflow bucket that could be used that uh, uh, solution validation or things like that. Uh, Scheduling verification, ready for review. Problem validation, probably. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. Solution validation. So like uh, pretty that much answer. anything, uh, like one of those. Yep. That actually problem addresses validation. another point I had with the columns. Yes, yeah, it does. It's actually nice. OK. So maybe we use the problem validation label and that we can just look at it on a regular basis and throw it out there to say, hey, we have a question in lines with what we're working on for an upcoming milestone. And um, we can line it up with uh, what Camille was saying, maybe have someone run ahead on that one and, and validate the problem, ask some questions, get Josh involved where needed. Yeah, yeah. We, we had this concept of a spike, which which is, I think, the term that's commonly used for this kind of stuff where if you're if you just don't have all the information yet to really make an informed decision about how you want to build it um like we, we call it a spike story so we would create a kind of a placeholder story so where i mean kind of the the goal and the requirements were clear like like the what mm -hmm. uh, but the how was not clear so and when people said well i really need to really get my hands on it and like research it so so then we would create these spike stories and i would just walk over the board in the same way other stories do. Uh, but the outcome was really just a decision on, okay, now we have confidence on how we want to build it and then we actually build it. So that was something we've done in the past as well. Yeah, I've used spikes pretty successfully in other companies as well. Uh, so label has problem validation. Um, I think that it's important that the result of such meetings should be always some kind of comment on the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So to keep this asynchronously, like everyone who is posting the bit of agenda should be responsible for posting some kind of like result of the meeting into appropriate issue. We are not going to record it, right? Or do we? Do we record such meetings by the way usually in GitLab? Uh, again, sorry. Do we record uh, record such meetings in GitLab? Mm -hmm. When you're okay. um, going through iterating on design, yeah, I, I would think so. Share with others because I mean, you have such a distributed group; it'd be hard to get everybody in the same meeting. I mean, this is a rare occurrence, right? And did I miss anything? This looked like a good idea. I'll take silence as acceptance. And we can always um, keep adding more comments this asynchronously as ideas come up afterwards. So unless there's anything else on that one, um, move on to the next one. So dev onboarding, Matthias, this was you. Yeah, I mean, I, this is not really team specific, right? It's just something, you know, being new, <laughs> it just came up. And I know some other people had like similar struggles. So, um, 
some of these things I kind of learned by trial and error in the end, which is, which is good. But I, I've, I felt like uh, the actual engineering onboarding is pretty light. Uh, like I felt like most of the two weeks I spent on kind of like office <laughs> work, you know, like very mm -hmm. kind of, uh, yeah, more like the wider, com wider company topics, I would say. Uh, and it wasn't really clear still how a lot of things work that you just need for your daily development workflow. Mm -hmm. So I almost think like this is something for like outside of this group to bring up. Um, yeah, also like Chun uh, mentioned that in the last, um, he pointed us to uh, in the, in the uh, engineering um, weekly review, uh, that there was a point around, there's also a bunch of people who don't feel comfortable around Prometheus yet. So, so there's a couple like areas where I think there could be more like knowledge sharing be done, especially for new joiners. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's just you have this overwhelming mass of information and it's very hard to uh, decide what to look at next, right? So it's very, very full base and that makes it hard and tedious uh, to learn all these things. Um, yeah, that's just a general feeling I had. Trying to think of what what we could do about that. I so, think I think ahead. to create a proper bootcamp is something really hard for GitLab, from what I observed. Because like to make a proper bootcamp to like get some general knowledge of the company of the of the products we use, it takes it will like postpone the actual uh, boarding of the team member into into actual team. So we. I, I don't believe we will do that soon in in the company, but maybe maybe we should create uh, not create maybe we should like pick uh, issues for new team members more precisely to control like for example to pick some issues that would be would give a nice observation of the our product. I know I know it sounds not easy and we don't always have such issues, but maybe uh, we could help. They struggle by picking uh, first issues very carefully for a new team member and trying to check how is it going with them. Yeah, because I, I, I understand the struggle, and I would also love to have like some time to have overall observation of Prometheus and all this kind of stuff. But I, I currently I can't see how this could fit our like company boarding from what I see. Especially since we started in the team already. So in my previous remote company, we had a boot camp. It was like a month. It was very long, way. Oh, and wow. we didn't work on a special team. We worked with some special mentors. They called boot camp members. They we tried to touch as many areas of the pro project as possible, and then we decided on the team after hmm. that. But oh, it's yeah, like that's, total that's reward of, of the company. Them. Yeah, and yeah. I don't see how it could fit. No, I mean, I didn't mean to suggest necessarily to do it. I, I didn't. I didn't suggest to do it like this way or another way. It's just I just wanted to. I, I just observed that I, I found it. Um, I left with a lot of question marks. <laughs> yeah. uh, I came out of onboarding with a lot of question marks, especially in the in the technical area. So so there's like any number of ways we can yeah. go about it. It could be just by uh, pairing up more with uh, someone who has done all these things before. So so I guess the the biggest area for me it sounds pretty broad but it's it's like the, the current onboarding it's not very like workflow oriented there's a lot of like different topics like uh here's a section about monitoring and here's a section about merge requests and but but none of these are really there's like no workflow narrative to them right so what i want to see is more something like okay uh so you need to get that you want to contribute something to, to get that here are the steps from a to z you know from like you know setting up gdk through you know, making a change, opening mm -hmm. an MR, getting it into production and through staging and explain along the way, and then monitoring at the end as well. Basically all the DevOps stages, right? So, so there's no, it's, yeah, it's kind of like ironic because like that, that's what we're building, right? Uh, and um, I, think, I think that's kind of what's missing is this. Um, uh, I, I agree on this one with Matthias because the handbook is really detailed and there are a lot, a lot of information, but you cannot find the actual workflow, for example, from all onboarding things that I read about engineering and developing stuff. The, 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 the thing that helped me the most is the memory team one-on-one -on -one video 
where like yep. we saw Definitely. the whole process like we were debugging we were searching the logs uh, the merge request was merged and camille explained like all the environments there like there is a staging yep. there totally. is uh, there, there is pre pre-production there is canary and the whole process was more or less clear like how do you you use the Exactly, because it was well, use case but, oriented, right? It was for solving but this are using problem. infrastructure and everything else. So maybe yeah. you know, things like this will be helpful. Also, I was struggling to like understand the different like configurations and options that we like use for uh, uh, like Omnibus and GitLab.com and yeah, there are also various options to like set up your own environment. Right, I think yeah, um, maybe <laughs> something we should be onboarded to as well. That's like it's... yeah, that's definitely true. Like environments and like maybe a couple of one-on-one -on -one videos on Mac for Linux usage or both. I mean, Mac like workflow, daily workflow, Linux daily workflow would be nice. Maybe maybe one-on-one -on, -one on Prometheus with those would be nice since. It's kind of cross team thing that pops so, up. So, like, there is interesting uh, and I believe quite unexplored thing at GitLab that because of our remote nature, we don't really share uh, our development like tricks that we do. How how we kind of like uh, I don't know run tests or like how we even like program things and like how we how we test them. And I believe. But this is my, my assumption, like everyone goes like does all of that kind of in their own way, uh, kind of learning to like how to contribute to GitLab, but there is like very big challenge like to share like your development tricks uh, of how you are doing stuff because uh, we run different systems, different configurations, uh, with different like setup, and things like that so it's very e it's very hard to translate that but uh, it's also kind of like i guess uh, inefficient because like not everyone is fully focused on like making the workflow super efficient uh, but i would assume that it's also quite inefficient in a way how you uh, develop stuff at, at average so Okay, I mean, that's a fair point, but there's, there's certain things that don't change, right? I mean, how, how a change is being deployed, how deployment pipelines work, uh, I think it's just something that should be part of onboarding, it, like, you know, get, getting your contributions um, deployed, or how to monitor them, that, that's kind of the same for everyone, right? It's a pretty streamlined process. You just need to figure out, like, where do these pipelines run? And that took me a while to figure that out because it's not really straightforward. Um, so, so, so those things I think could be part of the onboarding. So, <clears throat> I, I, I think the question is like, uh, do we have or did we check if like our uh, library's description of like the workflow is well documented? Because technically, uh, like everyone should be using workflow libraries to indicate like the status of the merge request, status of the issue. And whether chains are merged, it should be automatically uh, provided to you by a bot changing the label. So uh, maybe like what we need to do is to ensure that the workflow-based workflow is well documented and you kind of rely on the workflow-based workflow to do uh, their own stuff. And like do not care about like how many deployments we have but more care about that there is like workflow staging happening on your issue and you can actually validate that. Yeah. Because like, it's kind of like the moving target. Like today we have staging, uh, like product, canary and production, but tomorrow we have something different. Uh, but like single source of truth, like workflow labels is probably like what we should be optimizing for. And it's a really interesting point. It's just like, I could, I, and I'm just speaking for myself here. I, I would find this like, extremely unsatisfying because I want to understand how things work, you know, especially if something doesn't work, you know, like if for some reason it doesn't move from like one stage to the next, I just kind of want to look at stuff, you know, <laughs> like see how, th how things work. So I would not be happy with this, just being told, oh, there's this like 
abstract label that you put on something and then yeah it'll be deployed you don't need to know why that's yes, like, yes. Uh, <laughs> matthias like it, it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> defy but like having like the starting point just follow yep. work from libraries to like yep. to like to get your things uh vetted by merge validated yeah uh, and like be sure it's like kind of a good first step because then like you can cross check what is happening behind these work from labels who is assigning them well on, on what circumstances but like having like kind of established process for like the newcomers which is kind of it seems like this is the trouble right now like we have so many different stuff happening in the background that is kind of like hard to understand at least from what i see like hard to understand yeah if your trend is like done or not done because technically today work process you can close the issue uh only when like you validated that on the staging or production that's that's that's, that's the current definition of when you can close the issue after yeah. things are merged so um, I have a, like a side note to this because I'm really curious if I was the only one struggling with this, but it took me a long time to figure out. So, so the way I think it is currently um, how things are documented basically is we have the handbook, uh, then we have docs.gitlab.com, which is more like a manual of sorts, right, for GitLab. And then we have all sorts of documentation sitting in MD files in individual repositories, but they're not really linked from anywhere. I had a really hard time like reconciling all that stuff. It wasn't really clear to me like what what like kind of documentation because they all live independently. Uh, should I turn to it for what? Because the like docs of GitLab.com they often cover things like about configuration. So I think oh, okay, that sounds right. I want to know how to whatever like change the number of Puma threads. But then it's written in like very much like an end user way and often it only applies to omnibus and it all gets super confusing quickly because it's not clear like who the audience is is it, i'm as a developer or contributor are these instructions to me or is that written to users like using gitlab but they're not actually developing for it do you know what i mean like it, I, I, yeah. I, I i have a very simple answer for you about gitlab.com is like everything related to like being employee of the gitlab DocGitLab.com is like documentation created out of the repositories. So like Omnibus repository, uh, GitLab CE, GitLab EE repository. This is this is what is living in the DocGitLab.com. So anything in a doc folder in any repository is is that being deployed to docs.gitlab.com? Yes. Oh, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> so like so like DocGitLab.com is related to running application and developing to the application where about github.com is everything related to running the company right but so when you say so dr gitlab.com is that only the doc folder from the main gitlab repository because there's a bunch of other things like there's it's from uh, all repositories so all like repositories. it's from the omnibus gitlab runner uh, gitlab ce gitlab right. ee and every uh, every other repository that you might Think right. that it's kind of like documentation related to running this particular module, uh, but you're gonna find exactly the same documentation in the repository that you see on the doggitlab.com. Cool. Okay, so actions I wrote down from this, so I can take this up with other managers and ask them about their uh, if they have the same experience. We're gonna be somewhat unique because. We have Camille who's been here forever, who kind of knows where everything is. And then the rest of the team are all, all of us are less than five months. And most of us, at least half of us are probably less than three months. So we're in a bit of a unique situation, I believe. Not to diminish what you're talking about, but I absolutely agree that um, there was no onboarding template for, for the memory team when I joined. And I only ran across the distribution one. So, I will ask other managers if they run into this same issue and how, what did they do? You know, did they continue to focus on their own team's onboarding or do they have a list of onboarding templates? I'll see what other information we can get. And then maybe um, I'll ask on the engineering weekend review as well, see if people are willing to link out or share their onboarding templates. 
maybe maybe what we need but it's not really like <laughs> that important anymore because like we kind of hired all the folks for the team uh, except one like having our uh, onboarding for the memory team like an additional checklist that like you have to like mark as item that you kind of look over and like linking one-on-one -on -one, linking relevant documentation with the travel workflows uh, linking what we are doing maybe like linking uh, uh, like major stories that we are following so uh, but i'm not sure if it's very relevant but it should definitely help before like other folks joining but like yeah. probably now it's too late no, I've seen like both Nicola and, and Matthias have added stuff. I think everybody's added stuff to the memory team onboarding. So thank you. And we've actually, I've had people from other teams see our onboarding template and appreciate the contributions there. So yeah, just keep making it better for the next person. The next person might not even be on our team. So, and it might be, you know, maybe it's something that comes out of this is an entry in the handbook that says, hey, here's a list of onboarding templates. You might find some things useful, even though it's not your team. All right. Uh, I, I agree. The memory onboarding issue was not just about like memory team. M maybe some, some like one or two points were like just for memory team but the rest for example memory one-on-one -on -one video is totally like worth looking for every new developer yep cool all right so let's see developer innovation time during the week lots of feedback on this um sorry, i'm just reading alexis now personally don't feel you need the time Anybody have any thoughts they want to add here? Well, my first question would be, do we know if that's being done by any team in the company so far? Like in a, in a more like, you know, well-defined way, not just, oh, I'm going to go and do this and that thing. <laughs> right. I see Camille shaking his head. So I would, I would rely on his answer more than anybody else at the moment. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so like, so like I, I'm very long with this company and like since like at least three years I was thinking like, when I see like a manager of the team of like implementing uh, that stuff, having like some free time to do, uh, but it was always a challenge, like to get it done, and like it didn't uh, kind of work out in the end. Uh, I, I I brought my opinion about that. Uh, I'm 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 like. Uh, in the hindsight, it seems like it's a great idea, but like I didn't yet see this like working uh, like very well uh, in my career. So I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that like the, the major issue that like that people ask for doing that explicitly is like that you are oversubscribed and stuff. If you have more free freedom, more time, like you always should be able to like to start something on the side, like my GCK. I started GCK not because I had the time, because I, I felt a need for doing that to improve my workflow. And uh, in my case, but this is my opinion, if I would have like one free day, like to do whatever I want, would it actually make me do this kind of research stuff? It doesn't at least work for me that way. Uh, it's not that like I can say that on that day I'm doing this particular stuff, doing research. It's kind of more like, I, I, I have a day that like I three days work do something at random that is fun, but then I get back to my regular work. It's not something that is very structured, but maybe for some other people it could work better. Uh, but always uh, I, I find a time to do that when I felt that I have a little free time in my schedule to do stuff. And every time when I was struggling on getting my things done, rushing, uh, it felt miserable and I was not able to kind of do anything outside that because I wanted to get my things done. So, um, at least from my perspective, it feels to me more like uh, that this idea generally pop ups and like also like in my experience because uh, people are, are oversubscribed and they are rushing to get their things done. If you have some free time, you're, gonna, you're always going to have some time to start something that feels suitable at the given point. 
Yeah, I really like that answer actually, because I also noticed that if you have these set kind of allocated time slots for this, um, it, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, it cuts into people's schedules, right? So then they kind of maybe even feel like, oh, should I be, <laughs> should I come up with an idea now, you know, that, you know, just to fill up that time that probably also doesn't make sense. On the other hand, I've also seen the opposite because people, they are, they are different, right? And I've also seen the problem where if you make it like too undefined, like how, how to go about these things, then people would just never do it because they always feel guilty about it, right? So they always think, oh, but I should be working on this because that's more important as a company priority. Uh, so, so that's also then the potential that you miss out on interesting ideas that people just don't, they feel guilty about pursuing them. And I think that's also, that's the other extreme. So I don't know what a good in between is between the two, but, um, I, I like the idea of being generally open to the idea uh, mm -hmm. that if someone has a great, like GCK is such a good example for this. It's so useful. Um, and I think it would be good as I would like as a team to then be able to say, I think that's a great idea. I think we sh should allow folks to pursue that idea uh, unless it interferes with project priorities, you know, um, and then kind of, yeah, let, let it up leave it up to the individual to decide how they allocate their time to, to work on it. Like, like, like the one problem that I see also with the pay allocated time, uh, it very often might end up uh, that you feel that like as a free day or vacation, if you don't have the idea what to work on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so um, what happens then? Like, do you actually have the free day or do you work on the regular? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> previous company, you were working on your regular ones if you don't have, like, because, yeah. 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 So I found I, myself also never, never getting that far because there was always a lot of stuff on my schedule. So, yeah, I couldn't, like, let it go. <laughs> I, I, I had the opportunity to work with people and I, and I really loved it, that was able to say ahead of the time, like in, in, for the milestone, this is the capacity that I can do that. And usually it was like very fine to like to say, uh, like be respectful of your time and saying exactly how much you, you have to do. I, I'm, I'm very bad example, uh, but probably most of the engineers kind of they're gonna try to squeeze yet another thing into their uh, schedule to get more things done. Uh, uh, but I'm gonna challenge like everyone and myself as well every time. Can we like schedule less on ourselves? Less, less of the burden world's not gonna end. We're gonna have more time. We're gonna be more sane. Uh, and we're gonna have a time to do uh, things that we like, not only things that we are kind of like, we have to do. Yeah, because and that's actually a topic for later too. There's there's a topic about scheduling and pre-assigning. So, and it's a follow-up from our previous retro. So, um, the one thing I would say about this, and it's going to sound kind of wishy-washy and non-committal, but um, as a manager, I'm absolutely supportive of innovation time, and it scares me to death when I hear specific numbers called out because I've seen it weaponized in good ways and bad ways at other companies like, nope, this is my 20% time. It, just to use your example, Matthias, absolutely not picking on you, but I, I don't need to work on this priority. Somebody else can because they already use their innovation time and it's just, it's not healthy. Um, I, I, and I've seen it, it used in other ways like, well, I only need to spend 30% of my time in support and everything else I need to do features. So, I would, I'm in support of this. I'm struggling to find a way to say it other than that, you know, be, be flexible, make your time on trying new ideas and throwing out ideas to the team. Um, but I would be hesitant to throw a number on it. Does that make sense? Anybody yeah, that sounds first? totally reasonable to me. Okay. Uh, it's not really an action because it's not specific. <laughs> probably, probably like the only action point. If you have the great idea, just start doing that and communicate to your manager.
How's that? All right. Uh, let's see, planning issues. So we've had two of these planning issues and just spin up a third one. Uh, any feedback on how that's working so far? No feedback. So it kind of falls in line with the asynchronous planning, grooming, um, try to throw them out there with themes. Here's the things we're going to be working on for the upcoming milestone and then fill in uh, as the current milestone. So planning is for milestone plus one while current while in current milestone, I try and throw in issues in there. Here's, here's the things we're working on. Here's specific issues that we should prioritize so that people can discuss um, gotten good comments and feedback on them so far. I plan on continuing to do them unless I hear otherwise and absolutely always willing to listen to ideas on how we can better do them, how we can continue to improve. I mean, I like it. I think it's useful. It's good to have a reference point to come back to, um, you know, mid, 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 um, mid cycle. Okay. So dev support rotation, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, I was trying to think of actionable ways that we can do this because right now we're kind of in the middle of, you know, um, Alexi and Nicola focusing on import and export and um, Tinu and Matias focusing on sidekick. So how we would balance that with incoming bugs and we're a little different as a memory team, bugs aren't gonna come in as frequently, I would think, as a feature team, right? It's going to be, they're going to kind of ramble in. There's going to be less of a direct line to the memory team. So looking for ideas or thoughts on how or if we should even do this. There was one thumbs up. Thanks, Matthias. But any ideas or any thoughts on if we should formalize this or are we okay with continuing on with um, having general themes and folks assigned to it? and Taking on bugs as they come in. Sorry. Personally, okay. I don't think it, it, we are ready to formalize it at our current point because we are still, still not clear about our like expertise fields of every team mm -hmm. member and our goals are still aligning. We just recently started looking for experts. So I feel like uh, it's better to apply our best judgment in place. When, when some issue comes up, we probably know who will be the best fit to to start working on it at least and maybe pull more resources from team members. So I'm I don't feel like I need formalization for this topic personally. Yeah, I think I had the same feeling. I, I was reminded of this this uh, today or yesterday, um, Joshua, uh, that he posted uh, this ongoing this long running issue as well where Square is trying to migrate to GitLab or something. They have problems with the import export. Uh, and I was immediately thinking, um, I'm not totally sure, like, should we like look into this straight away or like who, who will be doing this? Because that, that came up as like a non-planned kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if, if we say, I mean, because the problem is with um, no one, no one, if no, no, no one specifically is responsible, then no one is responsible, right? So <laughs> yeah. we need to then kind of rely on the team to really make sure that um, someone will respond to these things and feel responsible. <laughs> okay. See, so from our last retro, um, the feedback was we were almost oversubscribing by assigning uh, prior to the milestone, assigning as much as we thought the team could take and individuals could take from the capacity standpoint. So um, I think it was 12.5, tried to assign at about a 50% rate. And um, I just want to get some feedback on that. The, the reason I put this in here is there were a couple times where folks were saying, what do I work on next? Um, so that's an indicator that our workflow is not 
very well defined at the moment. So any thoughts on this? Uh, the only point I have, like usually when I'm creating an issue, like follow-ups and stuff, I usually assign it to myself, which is mm -hmm. not correct, I believe, but it happens automatically for now. I just noticed that. I just feel that uh, it's not easy to unassign from yourself, like if you assign already. So I'm, I'd rather say it's better not to assign everything up front because like priorities could change and you feel like you could even block the issue for someone else. For example, I have a number of issues assigned for import export, but then, for example, some bugs popped up that I should fix and new team member could overlook the issue assigned to me thinking that I'm working on that. Or we need additional synchronization for that. So I'd say it's better to assign only items you're going to work very soon. This so uh, I, I I understand that, uh, like I, I I have the same problem. I'm usually assigning like all the new created issue to myself as well. But I completely agree with you. Like probably the best way is to really not assign to anyone. Kind of leave it hanging and assign to yourself when you actually work on that. Yeah, I it's, I, it's, I, it's I agree. just it's just much more clear yeah. indication who is doing what instead of like who should be doing what in the future. Uh, yeah, which kind of like yes. I fell into the same trap where I created a couple <laughs> issues that came up because they were problems, you know, related to psychic or something. And then they show, show up in your lane as well on the board, and it gives you this bias as well that oh, it's assigned to me. I should be working on it, <laughs> but it's kind of like just something you, you know, you broke out yourself from another story and never actually went through the planning process. Yeah. So and and yeah, it's really hard to get out of this. So I, I actually agree. So I fell into this trap myself. I think we shouldn't probably do that and just just it's good to capture these issues but then they should go in the backlog first so that they go through the whole grooming process so that you focus on the stuff that actually needs to be done i also uh, feel like uh, sorry i also feel like this uh, sidebar top bar we have on gitlab with our issues to do and merge requests is actually really useful to for your workflow that's why i would like to keep it minimal to not have too many merge requests and too many issues. And only the ones I need to take action. So it's like my to-do list usually, which is fine. But there is there is also another trap, which is the milestone. Because like a lot of stuff we assign milestone, the current milestone or the future milestone. So like I don't know what is the answer for that, but probably like some of these items could still be like tackled in the current one. Uh, but some of them kind of like uh, lose at the importance when you solve that uh, like issue, another issue. So um, I'm also like maybe maybe like one of the ways is like to assign everything to like to the current milestone, but like force ourselves to trash this issue on the next uh, memory team meeting to to decide what we do with them and when like uh, are like discussing that yeah i think unless it really blocks your immediate immediate progress i don't think we should actually add it to the current milestone i, I know i've done it myself and but that was probably not a good idea because i also noticed that some of the issues that i broke out from existing ones but they didn't really need to needed to be worked on right away so they, they had me assigned on it they had the current milestone on them and now they slipped and now some of them have this label missed 12.5 but we never had initially planned to include it in 12.5. So it's a bit of, you know, a bit unfortunate. So it kind of yeah. makes it look like we had meant to do it and we didn't do it, which isn't true. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's right. That, that's right. I usually assign it to current milestone as well, which is not correct. I agree with Matthias because all these like missed issues, they're important to understand like that we over planned, that we had some issues, mid cycle, some burn chart is not working well. But we shouldn't assign it on the current now, so I guess. Unless like it's a bug fix or immediate refactoring, you're going to follow up closely after the close issue. Yeah, and there's but some... even then, even then we need probably to discuss the fact that we are blowing up a bit. Oh, maybe we could add that to the agenda, the meeting agenda, new issues that have come in. Mm. 
Um, and there are some upcoming features, right, about um, issue dependency that may help us to better understand. Because right now we can't, it's, it's hard to link issues together and say that this one's blocking that one. All we really have is a related feature. So maybe that would help us, help us to understand um, dependencies, how much we're adding to the issue, uh, sorry, how much we're adding to the milestone uh, when we're oversubscribed. So I think some of those new features will help. Yeah, I also agree with Camille about like uh, assigning yourself to the issue should mean like that you're working on because for example, Alexei now has issues for import expert and all sub issues assigned to himself. And now I'm also assigned to some of them and I guess it's not really clear who is working on what, so. Yes, I've also, I won't unassign them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's correct. So it's one action item and to unassign ourselves from <laughs> existing issues. That we're I not. guess so. I guess so. It's yeah, I mean, it's like, here. I mean, sometimes because, you know, sometimes you are still, like, you know, thinking of, about a particular issue and you, you make, you can iterate on like the problem description or something. So, but yeah, you're but not actually okay. working on the it's solution, okay. you know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can still do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay to unassign yourself. And if you know something is not going to make it in the milestone, kick it out, right? So we don't get those misdeliverable labels, which, you know, other companies I've worked at where they follow strict scrum, you have discussions about velocity and why things were missed. And that's just, that's not a thing here. So don't feel bad about moving issues around. All right. Um, and I've already added to the weekly meeting template bullet point to talk about any new work created for the week so and matthias you had the next one oh sorry i need to remind myself yep Mars. yeah I, I, you know what like we, we kind of cover this i think by just talking about um how we go about planning because yeah that yeah it's like these smaller things that we find while working on something else we break out a bunch of newer ones but maybe they're like not super important straight away right uh, mm -hmm. so yeah i think we basically said what we would do right we we um put it in a future milestone uh and then we can just reprioritize it again so it should be covered that cover it, create the issue, don't assign to yourself, put it in future milestone. Okay. And I put this in here and it's probably something folks can read offline uh, or later. So geo team, crap, I thought I'd put, there it is, in here now. They have gone to more of a weekly cadence and, um, following a little more of the Kanban workflow. So if folks haven't read this now, um, or if folks haven't read this prior to, and we don't have anything to talk about, it's just something to read, different way to look at things. Um, it's, I, I'd say we're trending a little more closely to this because I do have weekly meetings with Josh where we talk about prioritization, make sure that if anything new is coming in memory team and the other teams he works with, we're aware of it. Um, but I would recommend taking a look at the issue where they called it out. Oh, hey, look, I did describe it. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Um, just take a look at their process, see if there's anything that we could adopt and make our processes better. All right, story kickoffs. Yeah, I mean, this kind of goes hand in hand with the discussion we had earlier about grooming as well, right? I mean, it's not the same thing, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, so so maybe maybe to make this distinction clear, grooming for me, or actually an issue description, uh, the original is issue description, it shouldn't actually, in my opinion, describe exactly how we're going to resolve it, but only what the goal is, like what mm -hmm. should be done, what should the outcome be. And hopefully also what does not need to be done because we might just you know postpone certain parts of it kind of to make the, the the boundaries clear right i think i think actually a good story description does not go into too much detail of the implementation because you don't know who's going to pick it up and then they might feel oh i should be doing it this exact way 
uh, but maybe they have a better idea how to do it, right? Um, so, so, so grooming for me is more about enabling this decision making, but not actually doing it. Uh, and what I was trying to um, get at here is the actual implementation work. So, assuming we have a story that's pretty well defined, um, we still need to figure out a way how to go about it. Uh, and uh, so, this was in response to this like story that sounded really simple in the beginning, and there was a very simple fix to it. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was also a pretty like long tail of refactorings that we could have done, and it wasn't totally clear on like how we should do that and uh, and, and when. So I'm wondering if it would also be helpful uh, and also to get people aligned on how we should go about something to when someone picks up a story uh, to actually talk about how should we be doing this so that people are on the same page and not like venture off for like three days and do something and then maybe it's not right. Or something. <laughs> That, that, that's all I was trying to say there. Yeah. So, like, yeah. so like what, what that worked for me in the past um, is like uh, the tissue description had the problem to solve, had the proposal how to solve the problem, and had assumptions uh, behind like the proposal because usually like you build, uh, like you propose a design of something based on like some assumptions of the design. And this is why it was like good enough. And actually implementation was really part of the uh, merge request description, like because it was implementing the specific design based on the specific assumptions. But uh, it seems that like also today, like a lot of time there is like discussion about like the, uh, like the implementation on the issue, but more into the comments of the issue, but not really in the description of the issue. Description like usually seems to indicate like the single source of truth, what we are implementing for who and for what purpose and like what is our design, uh, but doesn't like uh, go into detail exactly about like implementation because this is really like the, the, the what is part of the match request. That you are creating. Sure, but once you send the merge request, you've done all the work already, right? So if that's not going the right direction, you know, chances are, you know, you just lost. Time. So, so like, and this is a tricky part because what happens very often today is that you start merge request, the description of the of the merge request become a stale because a lot of the like discussion is on the comments, so you don't update the merge request description. And you also don't update the issue description exactly on what is implemented. Mm. So technically, like uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, if this was the proposal, uh, it would be really helpful if you at the end update issue description as well about like the like the how it did uh, end up in the end. And usually, like you end up also with some follow ups issues uh, because not everything can be solved. And uh, like usually what we do, like we have the epic that is kind of like barks a, a number of the issues, uh, but like we usually tend to close the, the issue, the original issue as close as, pos uh, as fast as possible, but then kind of like have a follow-up work, like the follow-up issues being created that kind of fork from this one, uh, documenting like specific aspects that were not covered by the original issue. So uh, there is, a, I think, a lot of housekeeping that like uh, we are not doing. It's like ensuring that like the description of the match request and the description of the issue actually reflects the truth. Uh, actually, it's a single source of truth of what is actually being done, mm -hmm. because yeah. then it's much easier for everyone to understand from the PM perspective, from the high level, it looks at the issue from the engineer it looks like the merge request because this is more close to, to like to the person uh, who is yeah. working on that. But are you suggesting to have the discussion in the merge request? So if you want to discuss specifically a particular implementation, <clears throat> particular solution, would you prefer to have the discussion in the MR or in the original issue? I, 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 I don't know the answer for that, but it really depends on like what level is that. Usually like you have some uh, rough idea uh, how it can be implemented, so you can kind of vet different approaches for implementing that on the on the issue as part of the comment, and kind of like documenting based on these a sort of the assumptions. 
For example, if we look at the memory killer, sidekey memory killer, one of the assumptions would be it runs at the separate thread. Uh, it doesn't look at the middleware. It rather like looks at the uh, current state of the system, uh, and this is this is like the flow. It doesn't de like detail like a lot of exactly how it's gonna be implemented, but it kind of gives you an overall picture exactly like the, the data flow that is happening or like the, the, the process that you are implementing and how it differs from, from uh, what it was done prior to this issue. And but I think we should be able to challenge these assumptions like because so I, I'm just worried that someone will pick up this issue. Let's say I wrote this issue and I write the assumption is it runs on a separate thread. Someone else might pick it up and take this as that's how it, they should be doing it. But maybe that's not the best way to do it. Right. So because so, it's not the goal for this thing to run its own thread, the goal is for it to be reliable and kill another process that runs out of memory, right? It, it, it really depends on how you look at that because like each of these things can be solved in different ways. Now, if you propose a design of something that is solves that particular problem, you also kind of make some design choices and you build it with some assumptions. You cannot say that if you remove this assumption, this design gonna be still valid. You need to reevaluate the design of yes, the problem totally, that yeah. you are solving. So I, I guess like the issues and merge requests, they are not set in the stone. So if someone wrote that in the past, it doesn't have to apply when someone picks that. So it has to be like usually you would ask uh, like person picking that to like to revisit that and ensure that it's clear that it's still sound in the current like architecture. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, it, it can just change the design and change the assumption. It's not set in the stone. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, we also decided earlier already that we're going to have this, use this label more, like the, I think, what was it? Problem validation or solution validation or both? Problem uh, validation. So maybe we can. Actually, yeah, yes, right. So, both, right? So once yeah. you go to MR, then you're probably in the solution. Well, no, solution validation is towards the end. Yeah, we should I all mean, read honestly, up on the labels. I think even, even earlier, if, if we find that a that, that uh, an assumption we had made or a proposal we had made, if we, if we want to challenge, I think everyone should be able to challenge this, right? And then we, we can maybe even before we start developing, uh, make sure that once it leaves this column, you know, uh, problem yeah. and solution validation, that we're really on the same page about, okay, so we know how we want to build this. And yeah. sure, there will always be more questions that come up, but at least the general direction <laughs> would be different. Yeah, I like Camille's this, um, suggestion. It's something we've talked about before, making sure the description stays up to date. The one thing mm. that I find a bit frustrating is when you update the description, there's no notification that the description was updated, so people won't notice. So if you really want folks to read, like if you add some assumptions and you want some validation on it, you're going to have to add a comment to the issue so that folks will know that the description has changed and you want, you want people to take a look at it. It's, 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 it's really interesting because we enabled uh, the feature today or yesterday on github.com for versioning issue and match request description. So you in the feed of the issue, you're going to see exactly what was changed. Oh, so, so, you I, can, I, I, oh, so you can see it, but there's no notification. So you can see the changes, but you don't get notified when a description probably, changes. Probably like, probably like some, some point in the future, you, gonna, you probably would be able also to receive the notification. But at least you can now see like what was changed historically. That's uh, great. Because this, because this was kind of like the missing piece that like usually was editing, removing mm -hmm. old content and losing this old content, which was mm -hmm. kind of not nice, but now there seems to be some feature that you can actually, and maybe, I, I, I don't know how useful is that, but this is really like the first step to having like this uh, version. So you kind of take a look exactly how this uh, description did evolve over time. I'm gonna send you a, like a link on that. On the, uh, That's awesome. I, I, oh, no. I missed that feature from Jira, being able to see what changed in the description, so even on things that I changed, because I maybe forgot what I changed. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, Any, anything else to talk about on that topic? So I agree, in general concept story kickoffs. I think the next big one that we'll have that's been talked about uh, recently is probably the um, web hooks, web sockets, sorry once we get to that project, because we still have quite a bit more work to do with import and export 
um, but we should have an asynchronous story kickoff on WebSockets to say, hey, we're going to start working on this. Here's the goals, and folks can ask questions prior to being expected to work on it, right? You need to have a better understanding and some slow on ramp into new stories rather than <laughs> here's your new story, start working on it today. And I think Chin Yu can tell us some horror stories about some of the omnibus work that he did. So. All right, if there's nothing else, um, I threw a line item in here about training or conferences, really just add. If you have anything you want to go to, it's not a commitment. It's not, it's not going to be approved or denied on when you put it in, which is for budgeting purposes. You need to know what conferences, what, what trips people want to attend uh, so that we can have a rough idea for the year. Um, it's just pretty empty right now. The, to answer your question, Matias, yeah, PostgreSQL is still going to be available for everybody once I actually um, land on a vendor or decide on a vendor. I've gotten feedback from one. I've reached out to a bunch. I've only gotten detailed feedback from one. It's pretty good. We may end up with them. But I need to ping some more people. I'm trying to nail that one down for December. That'll be available. But if there's anything like KubeCon, I know Dylan from the search team is going to that. Um, Folks from distribution are going to that, but just throw out some ideas, put it in the worksheet, and we'll have a projected budget for next year. I <laughs> actually, my internet just cut out for. I mean, I only heard the first thing you said. Sorry yeah. about that. No, I basically just said this exact same thing, but in far too many words. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then I uh, saw so today, you're... to my to my uh, dismay, that. Uh, there used to be this website called Lanyard, uh, which was, it was great. It was like this kind of social network for conferences so that people could put, like list what conferences they go to and stuff. That was great for discovering interesting conferences and it's down, like <laughs> it's been shut down. Oh, yeah. bummer. I know there's yeah. a doc out there for what other people are trying to attend. I'm not sure. I think it's shared. I'll find it and link it. Okay, and then Geekbot, yep, you all can add whatever questions you want. And I'm clearly not very creative because I haven't updated the questions for a while, so. Yeah. Uh, quick question, Uncle, when we should expensify this dinner? Like, when, when is the last date that we can do it? That's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think November, I think roughly this month. So, so Nicola, like the process for the uh, EACV dinner, which is like this crazy name. Previously, uh, it was named GitHub dinner, uh, then it was named GitHub Evangelis dinner, but recently they changed that to EACV dinner. <laughs> uh, is that like you can use that in this month and you can expensify if you have the receipt for this month? Uh, you can ask for like using that in the next month, but you should send the information like request to some email address that is on, in our handbook. Mm -hmm. So technically, if you if you know that like you're not gonna use the dinner this month, you can still use that in the December, uh, but you need to just send uh, the informatory email to I think it's ap at github dot com, but I yeah, may be completely I'll wrong. Thanks. You have until the 22nd if you want to request a one rollover. So you, to Camille's point, you can roll it over once. So you can accumulate two months, right? Like you can't wait a year and then go spend $1,200 on a dinner. They're not going to support that. Um, but if you feel you can't make it for the month, then prior to the 22nd, you can submit a request to say, hey, I want to roll over. And the rest of the details are in there. So, like, uh, it says 22nd, but I was uh, able to send it at 31st, and it was also approved. So, 22nd. <laughs> was that it's, the rollover? It's, it's or the handbook. Was that rollover no, because, or submitting the meal? Uh, like, no, like, 22nd is like the date uh, to, like, you have to send the information that you want to roll over that. Yes. Yeah. Like you, like you can, like you can use that like through the whole month. So like it can be like correct. Every, even like thirty first. Uh, but like in the past, I was able like to uh, send that like request on the thirty first because I know that I don't gonna use that as well. Cool. 
Okay. I want you to put the header on that one there. All right, so we'll see back up to workflow labels. And I just changed that. Go. Done. Done. <laughs> Thanks. Nailed it. Um, yeah, and feel free to add more, and then we can talk about it during team meeting if you add something. So I added the problem validation up front. Let me start watching that. Cool. And there's solution validation added at the end. I'm not sure what else is missing. So I have a bit related question to labels. I posted that in another issue where what went well, what didn't went well. Um, the question is, how do you select labels? Because for me, it's still like a very random process. I know like group memory and uh, DevOps enablement are essential for us, but what about other labels like which describe the feature? Like, should I put both project import and project export when I'm fixing import? Like, it's not clear. Do we have some guidelines or maybe are we going to improve the process of selecting labels for the issue? Do we even use them? Do we need them? I, I need to understand like the purpose of putting detailed labels. Are they used by pro product managers or project managers? What's the point? I can't answer for them and other companies, um... Yeah, we just use it for searchability, right, and categorization. Um, the only thing that I would be aware of is the group labels, right? Because that's going to dictate um, the which team's working on them and probably affect their board. So like group memory, that drives all of our boards. And if you put a group memory label on there and don't put the DevOps label, eventually the, the Git bot will add the DevOps label to it as well. So it knows which section you're in. Um, yeah, but, but my idea is that half, half built searchability is worse than no searchability at all. I mean, if you put only uh, labels randomly, then you will not be able to rely on that search. So we should either like set, I, I would say epics are more important than labels in our case. I'm mm -hmm. feeling like this. So epics are good for discoverability of similar issues and so forth. For labels, I just feel I'm putting whatever comes to my mind in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's important. Okay. Oh, it's probably customer related. Okay. But I could forget that. And that kind of uh, breaks the whole idea of searchability in the future because I could forget the label. Yeah. So I don't know. I get confused on that. I, I don't have good guidelines for you. I've searched for label guidance in our handbook and it's not great. I'd say use them liberally. If they're helpful for you, I know I use them. Okay. I can look. That's it. Any other topics anybody wants to cover? Yeah, just just a small uh, note. Uh, I, I noticed that we don't usually fit our like 30 minutes on Monday. I know that ideally we want to fit it, but maybe we want to rethink the process. Maybe we want to, I don't know, like go through agenda not issue by issue because we're usually not covering them and since we're going in like uh created order created by order it doesn't it, we, we could easily miss something important mm -hmm. so maybe we should go by epics first and then by issues if we have some time i feel like we're usually missing a couple of fast issues on every meeting yeah. so, so that's what, what in theory, these should be in priority order. So typically, I'm going top down. Oh, but okay. We still, we still have a lot in twelve six. We never did groom them. We never did cut it down. Um, the memory. Maybe team, we should go by assigned first. So, like, if the person has some concerns, uh, they could speak. Yeah, I have a team member board too, so we can do that. 
and the agenda is open to anybody. If you want to add topics in there to discuss, please do. Any other suggestions? All right. Oh, we have a few follow up items. I'll make sure they are tracked. And thanks, everybody, for your feedback. This was great. Thanks, all. This was great. Thank you. Have a good day. Hope you guys can have a good day. Bye.